All right, so welcome. Uh, if you want a copy of this presentation, there will be a link in the description in YouTube, or you could go to that bit.ly and uh, get one for yourself and then add it to your drive for future reference if you'd like. You can look at our district's mission and vision there and our agenda over on the side. So uh, without any further ado, let's get started. So we're calling this using Google Classroom during Delta during, in 2021. So we have a very unique situation and so our objective reflects that. So today, we're gonna explore best practices in using Google Classroom to address specific needs and concerns for the reality we're living in right now, right? Um, the reason for that is to leverage Google Classroom to organize subject matter and provide students with feedback uh, on, on their learning. And we'll know we got it if we can incorporate some of these techniques if efficiently into our instruction immediately. So that's our success criteria for today, okay? Our agenda uh, is, is simple, four things we're gonna take a look at. Uh, the first two have to do with organization, then maximizing the use of posting things in Google Classroom, and we'll wrap things up with some student pro tips, okay? So before we get started, I wanna give mad props to a lot of the resources uh, here. Um, Matt Miller and uh, Casey Bell's blogs, uh, respectively, provided a lot of really great tips and techniques that I'll be sharing with you, and I'll give them credit. Um, also, a uh, getting started with Google Classroom um, pre self-guided presentation I put together last year for that for that COVID year, um, borrowing some things from there and uh, from my brother from another mother, Ben Jefferson, um, his uh, presentation titled Google Classroom for Beginners. Lots of great uh, uh, resources in addition to what I'll be sharing with you can be found in all of those and they're hyperlinked on slide five of the presentation. Okay, so the first thing we wanna look at is organizing techniques in the classwork tab specifically. And we'll be going over these different organizing techniques. And so let's get started. But uh, first, uh, they all have to do with creating topics, right? And if you haven't done that yet, uh, you can click on the create uh, pill in the classwork tab. And one of the things that you can create is a topic. And then when you create posts in the classwork tab, uh, there's an area there where you can assign that post to a topic and it'll organize it under that topic. So what does that look like? Here's, here's what it looks like. So here's probably the most common way of organizing your uh, classwork tab is by creating units or modules. Right. Um, so here is an example of uh, five or six different modules and then a few assignments listed under each module. And we tried to uh, differentiate them with a symbolic emoji um, so that it not only sticks out, but we know that all the uh, little light bulb things, for example, go with that unit, right? Uh, by the way, if you want to get emojis to use in your Google Classroom, this is uh, probably the most comprehensive uh, site to find emojis where you can copy and paste them as text. Uh, that's the Emojipedia that's hyperlinked here if you want to take a look at that. Or uh, a quicker way of doing it is simply clicking, uh, right clicking uh, into any text field in Google Classroom. And one of the options there is to search for emojis. And so that's a, a pretty quick way to, to add emojis. All right, uh, probably the most popular way of uh, organizing the classwork tab in Google Classroom, uh, especially coming out of remote teaching last year is by by weeks. A great suggestion or pro tip in, in doing that is by organizing them those uh, weeks and the content under those weeks in a very predictable way. One way would be adding those emojis to highlight things. So maybe the week five is all the alien guy, right? Uh, week six would be 
um, the smiley face with the sunglass guy, right? Um, or um, if you're not really into the, the goofy emoji thing, then um, having a predictable pattern in how the daily things uh, appear in Google Classroom under each week can be very helpful. Um, you could also uh, uh, organize things by assignment type. So it, especially if you um, organize your grading scale in a, um, a, by weighted topics, right? Or weighted categories, this might be the way to go. So all of the quizzes might be under one topic and all the, um, uh, you know, reading assignments might be in another topic. And um, so, so that's another way of organizing. All right, so all of that it may have already have heard of, but uh, this is a rather uncommon yet uh, very practical way of organizing things. And this is by creating a, a topic that's called today, and that gets updated every day, and only today's topic goes in there. So when you create a, you know, whether it's materials or assignments, uh, it goes in the today topic, and then when you're done, uh, you know, for the next day, you just drag it or, or edit it into the uh, course or in the correct um, topic. And so when you create the assignment, simply um, click the today um, uh, topic when you're creating it, and it'll be at the top of your, your stream. So you could put the today stream at the top, and it'll look something like this. Okay. The other um, great tip that I've, that I've seen here and several people have suggested this is uh, having a past assignments topic. So if you're just getting started and you know it's October and now you're getting started with organizing the Google Classroom and you're like, oh, it's too late. Now I just have to live my entire uh, semester, maybe the entire year in this, in this mess. Well, no, not necessarily. Create a past assignments uh, topic and just take a few a few moments to drag everything uh, uh, prior to today under there and then start anew with uh, you know all the topics that, that are relevant or however you're going to organize things um, you know beginning today so there's that um, uh, Casey Bell, who I referenced at the beginning here, uh, made this suggestion, and I thought it was a really great one, is of uh, coming up with a naming convention, but not just a naming convention. This suggests a very specific one where you use a hashtag and uh, a number, um, you know, with the description of the uh, of the assignment. This has a couple of unintended consequences uh, or benefits. One would be um, it, it stays organized in your drive when you create things that way, um, especially if you have everything alphabetical, so it'll stay alphabetical in your drive. But I don't know if you're, you're, you're thinking about this with me too, your, your grade book will be organized that way too. And you know, th that alone I think is a great way of organizing your, your grade book so things are easy to find. And, and here's her reasoning for this, is um, to make it easy to find material right, for you and your student in Google Classroom. So you can use the search function, so use Control F or Command F if you're using a Mac, uh, to find uh, the numbers and the, uh, the hashtag and the numbers or, or the description of the thing you're looking for, right? And, and here's why using that, right? Um, so you can uh, search for a number, so hit control F and search three, and it'll give you all instances of the number three, and that includes the dates, um, the assignment I'm looking for, uh, perhaps a, you know, a, a chapter number and things like that. So, so it's not very efficient, but if you search specifically for hashtag zero three, uh, you know, there's one instance of it, right? And uh, you can easily find things that way in your Google Classroom, both you and, and your students. Um, and then uh, another cool tip, I think, is to not assign a topic to specific assignments. Um, specifically, those assignments that you want to exist at the top, easy, that are easily 
easily findable for your students, right? Um, like maybe a, a website that you visit daily or you know very often that might not have a topic but it's posted as a material and so because it doesn't have a topic it stays at the top of your classwork tab right um, in this example the link to the digital textbook is there it could be maybe your classroom website uh, or something like that uh, maybe the syllabus can be at the very top if that's something you reference often or maybe classroom rules or you know something you want students to be able to access often just leave it at the top there all right next thing we're going to look at is the stream organizing the stream all right, um, and the rule of thumb here for me is uh, it's called a stream, not a torrent. And so I like cleaning it up and actually just eliminating everything that's in the stream. Um, so uh, in order to do that, you'll open up Google Classroom and find the settings gear. You click on it and find uh, the little area that says classwork on the stream and click on hide notifications there. And when you've hidden the notifications, everything will be gone from the stream because the stream is a sort of a record of everything that's happening in Google Classroom. But if you eliminate that, there's nothing there. And then you can use the stream for announcements or right now links. So for example, if I want my entire class to all go to one website, you know, maybe a Nearpod or something uh, today, I can post that link in the uh, stream as an announcement, right? So the today links or the right now links can go there. Um, or you can use the stream for today posts, right? So what, what's gonna happen today? So maybe I've created an assignment in the classwork tab like I normally would, and here's an example of that, you know, this uh, assignment for today. After I open that assignment, I can click on the little hamburger dots up at the top there and click on copy link. And now I've copied a link to my clipboard of that exact uh, uh, assignment in Google Classroom. So now I can go up to the stream and using the attach link button there, paste that link right into there and uh, there's my link for today. So today's assignment will be on the stream and nothing else. Maybe an announcement might, might go there, but um, I can focus my students on that one thing. So the less number of clicks, the better, the more likely they are to, to actually click on it, right? And so that's there. And then I can delete that uh, post from the stream and it remains in my classroom wherever I put it, in the classwork tab wherever I put it. So that's, a, I think, a great technique for uh, using the stream. Related to that is the uh, turn in everything rule. So um, have students turn in everything, even if it's assigned in Google Classroom, but there's nothing to digitally turn in. Maybe it gets turned in in real life, right, on a piece of paper. Well, have them hit the turn in or mark as done button as well because then they can go to the to review or you can go to the to review section and get a little to-do list like this, right? Where um, you know what's been turned in and what still needs to be graded. And then um, it's kind of a one-stop shop to get all your grading done, right? Um, uh, the other benefit of doing that is that now you can use grade transfer, right? And if you haven't used that yet, uh, you got to try it. So on slide 28, I've given you two uh, about five minute uh, tutorial videos. You can choose whichever one to watch that they're both uh, pretty good, but you can watch those and um, um, it'll show you how to use this extension to automatically take your grades in uh, Google Classroom and put them into your gradebook in, in a matter of seconds. So um, if you haven't been using that, uh, you should definitely take advantage of that. Next thing I wanna look at is maximizing the assignment posts, okay? 
Um, so when you when you create an assignment, there's a few tips here that will, may help your students be a little more active. So I call this the obnoxiously detailed numbered checklist or the ODNC, right? Essentially, it's a very detailed, obnoxiously so detailed checklist that's also numbered. The idea behind this, and here's what it would look like in, in Google Classroom. The idea behind this is that um, I can uh, tell students the order of events down to the, 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 the detail. Like maybe number one is take a piece of paper out. Number two is put your name on it, right? Um, so this does a few things. First of all, I can ask students, um, what number are you on? And kind of know how, you know, how productive they're being. Or I could announce to the class, okay, class, uh, you know, 10 minutes have gone by. You should be on at least number four. If you're not quite to number four, um, check your distractions because you might be getting a little distracted. You need to pick up the pace a little bit. Or um, if you're way beyond that, go back and check your work because uh, some of these things may have had may have taken a little longer. You may have rushed through it. So let's let's go back and check that out. Right? Um, the other the other way is just a, a great way of gauging where everybody is. Right? You could have students you know pause halfway through class and then say okay what number are you on show me on your hand what number you're on right and then you can kind of gauge where students are at any moment so um no minutia is is, is unimportant in in this strategy um another uh tip that uh you might find effective is putting your objective directly into the uh, assignment post. So maybe put in the the uh, objective for the day, um, and then the directions. Right? Um, you know, and, and research has shown that a clearly communicated objective that tells students what they're going to do, why they're doing it, and uh, what uh, success looks like. Um, can potentially uh, double, sometimes triple the rate of learning over time. And so why not just put it right there where the assignment is and then go over it with the students, right? So um, on slide 33, there are three um, sentence frames or patterns, frameworks for creating um, clear objectives. So whichever one suits your fancy go ahead and use it or if there's another um, frame you use certainly maybe put it in the comments and share with all of us um, what you what you use okay um the next tip here is to create templates and or hyperdocs or hyperslides for students um and you know this might be something you're already doing but uh, we're gonna add a little twist to this in, in just a second. But uh, create an assignment and then give students a copy uh, or a template, a, a, a worksheet or a graphic organizer to use to uh, write down their, their thinking, to show their learning or whatever the case might be, right? And then make a copy for each student. So it's the equivalent of creating a graphic organizer on a sheet of paper, uh, uh, photocopying it and giving each student a copy for them to write on, right? Okay, so so doing that with either a document or a slide um, is effective. Um, and then students see this, right? When they create, when they open up the assignment on the right-hand corner of their screen, uh, they'll see the template under a your work box with their name already on it. I mean, it, you know. For all the times I haven't, I've had students not write their name on a sheet of paper, right? And this takes care of that alone, right? But there's an added benefit. So let me um, show you a few templates uh, for uh, doing this. So one would be what I used at the beginning of the presentation here, and this is my like uh, generic beginning of class slide. So you could post this as a single slide template, make a copy for each student. Um, and they do the warm up in the slide itself. So everyone has a copy of it. And now, you know, you can have the agenda on there, the um, objective for the day, the materials that they'll need for the day. And they have a timer to let them know how much time to uh, gather those materials and to finish the, the do now warm up, right? 
Um, so anything you want students to know at the beginning of class while they're working on the warm up, have it on the slide and then have them work directly on the warm up and turn that in. So then you have a single slide. There's no scrolling for you. It's all on one on one thing, right? So, so there's that. Taking that same concept, you can apply it to your presentation. So, uh, you know, you're probably familiar with Nearpod and Pear Deck and Classflow, which are interactive presentation tools, right? Where you can be uh, presenting a something like a, a Google slide or a PowerPoint, and the students see the same thing, and then they can interact on the slides. Well. You can do that with Google Slides uh, just as well, right? So give a copy of the uh, presentation for your lesson to all students and embed in specific slides ways for students to process the information, right? So in this example, I've given some information. I provided a, a little video to help reinforce the information. If they didn't quite get it from me, maybe the, they'll listen to the video a little more. Uh, and then a space at the bottom with, with a prompt. And in this case, this is one of my favorite ones to use is dumb it down for little Mr. Revis, right? Um, so explain this complex idea uh, to a five-year-old. So how would you dumb it down so that a five-year-old can explain, can understand it? So that's, that takes you processing the information and then communicating it in a simplified version, right? So, so there's that, or these different questioning techniques. So the, the first one is like question with a with a period, I call it. Questioning with a period, essentially what, what I mean by that is have students create quiz questions as if, you know, this is something that I think a teacher would quiz me on based on the, the information and then give them a prompt that says something like in the space below, type two multiple choice questions that have a, uh, a correct answer, a clearly wrong uh, option, a distractor that uh, might fool somebody who's maybe not paying attention and something silly, right? So, so something, something along those lines. Uh, an, another uh, technique here is questions with a question mark, right? Like what are some actual questions you have? So I just gave you this complex information. We went over this complex information. What questions do you have? And asking the question like that as opposed to are there any questions, which implies uh, a conclusion and moving on, right? Um, it, there's an expectation that questions should be asked, right? So quick story, I had a professor in college who would go through his lecture and he would uh, tell us uh, as students to write down the right questions as we're uh, listening, right? And then after his lecture, he would say, okay, what questions do you have? Give me your questions, right? And then we would ask her, her questions. And if he didn't hear the question he was looking for, he would go back and start all over and do the presentation again. And do now, I don't recommend you do that. But the concept I thought was good. There's an assumption that questions are are coming. So then it doesn't put me in a place where I really didn't understand this. Am I going to show my vulnerability? You know. Um, Hey, you wanted to know questions. Here's a question that I think someone else might ask. I'm asking for a friend, right? That kind of thing. And then a uh, question with, with an exclamation mark. I've seen several teachers do a version of this, but essentially uh, after giving this presentation, fill in this blank. I hope blank is not on the test, right? And so, um, you know, it might be a, a good exit ticket, right? So based on all this information, what's what's something you, you hope I don't test you on tomorrow? Because you know, we need to go over it some more, right? Um, in each of these cases, these um, can be embedded into your very own presentation, right? So students are interacting on that slide. With that in mind, um, uh, I've seen some folks suggest that you include a blank document onto the assignments. So even if there is no pre-made fancy template or pre-made hyperdoc or anything like that, uh, just include a blank paper to do the uh, um, for the students to do the work on. That way, you can view the assignment page in Google Classroom as a thumbnail like this. And that lets you see students' progress or lack thereof, right? Uh, right there, just at a glance in real time. And so you can uh, 
open up this view and maybe ask Amy, why, hey, why haven't you started? Can, can I help you with, with uh, you know, get, getting started? Um, so I thought that was a, a great uh, tip. This tip comes from um, uh, Mr. Christian Elaine at Little Rock High School. So give him mad props to to uh, this teacher, but he uh, suggested using announcements uh, as assignments, right? So um, if you're using the Google Classroom app or if your students are using the Google Classroom app, um, they'll find out that assignments get push notified, right? So students get push notifications for assignments, but not announcements. So if there's something you really want students to hear from you, uh, post things as an assignment. It could even be ungraded, right? And uh, post it as an assignment and then students get the, the notification on their phone that if they're using the app that this announcement happened, right? So I thought that was a really great suggestion. Um, and then uh, Casey Bell, who I referenced earlier, uh, also suggested using this as uh, the private comments area as a part of the assignment. So maybe I have given students the, you know, the, the template with you know, a, a place for them to process uh, their thinking related to a reading assignment, for example, um, and we're doing that in class and then I have them turn it in. Now the exit ticket for the day is give me two takeaways or what is the one most important thing from the reading or from the assignment that we just did in class, right? And that's the exit ticket. So it'll look something like this. Here's an example from Google Classroom. There's a reading assignment with a uh, passage where students were able to process their thinking and answer a few questions. And then the exit ticket was, what is a, one major takeaway from this week's reading? And so in the private comments up here, you can see what um, uh, this student said based on um, their reading. Um, and then in this view, when you're going through the grading, right, you can just click on this um, uh, little arrow and then go to the next one and you can see, um, the uh, show your work area, right, uh, on the document, and then the answer area in the private comments. So it's the equivalent of give me the answer, show your work. Okay. Um, the, this next uh, suggestion is to create a beta classroom. And uh, this is just a fake classroom where you can uh, almost use it as an R&D or research and development, right? So you can test um, uh, assignments or maybe you can plan out an entire week and have another teacher buddy as a student and you can be the student in their beta classroom, right? To pay it forward that way or maybe have a student volunteer or a TA or something join uh, that classroom. And then you can see what the uh, what it'll look like on the student side also and work out any kinks. Um, and then you can just either reuse the posts um, from, from that sample beta classroom into the real class. Um, or uh, you know, if you if you're a planner and you plan the entire semester, you can just copy the entire classroom and, and put it in another place. So all right. Um, last thing here is student pro tips. So I've put it all in, in one uh, sort of five minute uh, video that you can watch um, and I'll, it, it's hyperlinked here in the, um, in, on slide 47. It'll also be in the description. Uh, but essentially there's uh, these tips. So remembering to hit the turn in button or mark is done button. Uh, clicking the open assignment button after taking a survey if you're prompted to, um, checking the upcoming list in the stream and using the to-do list. So some of the uh, things you probably want your students to know in Google Classroom um, all in one place in a five minute video. Um, and the timestamps are on this slide. All right, so thanks for watching. Um, if you feel so inclined, please give me some feedback on have a wonderful, wonderful day.